one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, Overcoming Gravitational Fields. But before we get to tonight's podcast, we have some late news rolling in. You may recall that yesterday I had announced the fact that the second day of prayer and fasting held by the LDS Church on Good Friday, April 10th, 2020, seemed to have done the trick of turning away the tide of coronavirus deaths, at least in the United States. And not only did the number of deaths peak on Friday, it began to go down dramatically after that thus leading to a number of Latter-day Saints posting on Facebook that the second day of prayer and fasting held by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had obviously had the desired effect. Well, no sooner did that podcast go up yesterday than I received from a listener to this podcast an update. And unfortunately, this is bad news because it appears that the daily number of coronavirus deaths in the United States did not, repeat not, continue to go down after that second day of fasting. Instead, on Tuesday, yesterday, April 14th, 2020, the death tally once again spiked. This from Thomas Reuters News. In an article dated Tuesday, April 14th, entitled U.S. Coronavirus Deaths Set Single Day Record Increase. We have the following. U.S. coronavirus deaths rose by at least 2,228 on Tuesday, a single day record. According to a Reuters tally, the article goes on, the previous single day record was 2,069 set last Friday. That would have been Friday, April 10th, Good Friday, the second day of fasting and prayer in the LDS Church. So it appears that, unfortunately, the celebration regarding the effectiveness and the miraculousness of the second day of prayer and fasting and turning away the coronavirus may have been slightly premature. We will wait to see if a third day of fasting and prayer is called for by President Russell M. Nelson. I will keep you apprised as to any developments. But now on to tonight's podcast, which is titled, once again, Overcoming Gravitational Fields. Now, that's a strange title for a podcast, and let me tell you where it is that I came up with that title. It was a number of months ago, I was listening to Mormon stories, and John DeLynn was interviewing somebody. I'm sorry, I cannot remember who it was who was being interviewed. But toward the end of that interview, John DeLynn asked this person what they think the purpose of life is. And I remember hearing that question and the thought suddenly coming to my mind as to what the purpose of life is. And the thought that came to my mind regarding what the purpose of life is was those three words. The purpose of life is overcoming gravitational fields. Now, let me try and explain a little bit about what I mean by that expression and then give you a concrete example of how that expression has played out in my life in one very specific regard relating to my studies of the Book of Mormon. I was raised as a kid in the 1960s and early 1970s, and the space program in the United States of America was all the rage. It was everywhere. This was the time period when Apollo missions were going to the moon and back, and finally in 1969 actually landed a man on the surface of the moon. I was nine years old when that happened. I can still remember being outside, of course it was summertime, in Bellevue, Washington. This was shortly after we had just moved up to the state of Washington from Texas. And the first place that we lived was an apartment building in Bellevue, Washington. This is before we moved to Kent, as I've talked about before. The day was July 20th, 1969. And for me and the other kids that I was playing with outdoors at the apartments, it was just another summer day. We were having fun. We were not really connected with what was going on in the outside world. But I remember I was playing with around 10 other kids. We were out in the parking lot and some lady who I did not know came out onto her balcony and she leaned over the balcony and she yelled at us, hey kids, you need to get up here right now. Well, we had no idea what she was talking about, but this lady out of the goodness of her heart and a sense of the historic, which we did not have as kids, called all of us kids and there were about seven of us who went upstairs to her apartment and she sat us down in her living room so that we could watch on her TV Neil Armstrong take his first steps on the surface of the moon. Now, as you know, it's not an easy thing to get to the surface of the moon. In fact, this is something that John F. Kennedy had announced in the early 1960s that the goal of the United States was that by the end of the decade, by the end of the 1960s, we would have a man walk on the surface of the moon. And indeed, that is exactly what happened. One of the most difficult things you have to do in order to get to the moon is you have to first overcome the gravitational field 
of Earth. And that takes a great deal of energy and a great deal of rocket fuel. But if you're going to be able to leave the planet Earth and go exploring out into the universe, and in this case get to the moon, you have to first overcome the gravitational field of Earth. So what does the Apollo 11 mission have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, in the same way that astronauts have to first leave the gravitational field of Earth and overcome it in order to get out in space to explore, in a spiritual sense, we have to overcome gravitational fields in order to leave our religious preconceptions behind so that we can get beyond them and explore. So let's talk about these religious preconceptions for a second. I'm not saying we have to abandon religion altogether. What I am saying is that there are certain times in every religious person's life, a person who is raised within a certain religion, that they have to choose between an obvious truth and their religious belief. There is a truth that has become increasingly obvious to them, that it is indeed true, and yet that truth contradicts their religious preconceptions, their religious beliefs. And at that point, the decision is thrust upon them. Do I go with the truth or do I maintain and retreat back to my religious beliefs? If you stay with your religious beliefs, then you are staying on the planet Earth. If you go with the truth, you are overcoming that gravitational field. And through doing so, and by the way, it's not an easy thing to do any more than it's easy to get a rocket ship out into space. But if you do, you will find yourself able to leave the earth behind, so to speak, and go out into space and begin exploring and actually discover new things, new things that you would never have been able to discover if you had remained on earth, if you had remained with your prior religious preconceptions. So once again, here I'm just talking about theory. And I want to take this talk about theory and make it more concrete by giving you a specific example. Now, yesterday's podcast leads quite naturally into today's example because yesterday's podcast I left off by giving what I considered to be absolute proof positive that the Book of Mormon quotes passages from the King James Bible that should not be in the Book of Mormon, at least not if we understand the Book of Mormon to have been translated from gold plates that were a record of Jews that left Jerusalem in approximately 600 BCE. And I went over the details as to why that is the case there. I will not repeat it here. But this was a difficult thing for me as a Mormon to come to grips with because I had a preconceived notion. Now, granted, it was taught to me by the church. I didn't come to it on my own. But this preconceived religious notion as to how the Book of Mormon was translated and therefore what it could and what it could not contain. And the one thing it could not contain were passages from the King James Version of the Bible that could not be explained within the parameters of my religious preconceptions. But over time, I finally got to the point where I was able to accept the fact that indeed, like it or not, able to explain it or not, the Book of Mormon does contain these passages from the Bible, including passages from the New Testament, including lengthy passages from the New Testament, and lengthy passages from the New Testament that were in the King James English, that were obviously lifted from the King James Version of the Bible, a version that did not even exist until 1611, when the King James Version first came off the press. But as I say, I spent a considerable amount of time trying to ignore that fact. That's one of the ways we can deal with these kind of situations, is that when the truth begins to conflict with our religious preconceptions, we can simply ignore the truth in favor of our religious preconceptions. It is not easy for us to let go of those religious preconceptions because they are so meaningful to us, and I'll certainly say they were meaningful to me, and in fact, I had invested a great deal of time and energy and capital in those religious preconceptions, including going on a mission for two years to Japan. And I think that the more I invested in my religious beliefs, the harder it was for me to begin to distance myself from those very religious beliefs, even when it was obvious to me and becoming increasingly obvious to me that there was a truth that existed that I could not deny that contradicted those very religious beliefs. So as I say, that was a tactic that I used for many years was simply to ignore it. Now, I did not completely ignore the presence of the King James Version in the Book of Mormon, but what I did with it was 
I was invested in trying to explain why it was okay for the King James Version of the Bible to be in the Book of Mormon. In other words, I was involved in the apologetic end of the question. And I came up with, or really I learned from other apologetic writings, the basic explanations for why it is that it's okay that the King James Version shows up in the text of the Book of Mormon, and that this does not mean that it somehow conflicts with my religious beliefs. In other words, there are ways of getting around it and trying to harmonize that fact with my religious beliefs, so I didn't have to let them go. I could still believe in the orthodox traditional correlated version of Book of Mormon translation and the dominant narrative while still accepting the fact that the King James Version appears in the Book of Mormon. But I have to be honest with you, and eventually I had to be honest with myself, and that was the key, which was that none of those explanations that I had, and I had researched all of them, none of those explanations were really satisfactory. In other words, they were answers, but they were not good answers. And when the time came that I was able to accept that, even if it impacted my religious beliefs, once I came to that point, and I only came to that point by discarding some of my religious preconceptions about the translation method and the story that the Book of Mormon tells about itself and the story about the Book of Mormon that the church tells about the Book of Mormon, only then was I able to put myself in a position where I could actually explore those passages, those King James Version passages in the Book of Mormon and see what it was that the Book of Mormon was doing with them. And when I was able to do that, I discovered that actually the Book of Mormon was doing some very interesting and indeed somewhat sophisticated things with the King James Version in the Book of Mormon. But the main point I'm driving at is that I had to first overcome the gravitational field of my religious beliefs regarding the translation of the Book of Mormon before I could put myself in a position to explore and appreciate and understand what the Book of Mormon was doing with it. Now, this is something that is very, very difficult to talk about with most Latter-day Saints. And the reason is because they are where I used to be. They are committed to this preconception of the translation process, which is the dominant narrative in the church, and which, in fact, just got once again cemented in this most recent proclamation from the General Conference of April 2020, the proclamation on the Restoration. Abraham Lincoln had his Emancipation Proclamation. Russell M. Nelson now has his Restoration Proclamation. Because this proclamation says that the Book of Mormon was translated and once again goes back to the dominant narrative that the church has been teaching for over a hundred years. And I plan on doing a podcast in the upcoming days and weeks dealing exclusively with the new proclamation. But getting back to my subject, a number of years ago, I looked specifically at the Sermon on the Mount in 3rd Nephi, i.e. the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5-7, through which ends up appearing in the Book of Mormon. And it is obvious that this was lifted from the King James Version of the Bible. And when I looked at what happens in the Book of Mormon immediately before the Sermon on the Mount, which is reproduced there, and especially immediately after in the following chapters, I began to see that really what's going on here is that the Sermon on the Mount is not just filler that's thrown in to take up space. Instead, the Book of Mormon is actually doing something very interesting with the Sermon on the Mount as it's reproduced in the Book of Mormon. And I wrote a three-part article on this subject a number of years ago. And I want to share with you that three-part article at this point. And the reason I'm sharing it with you is not only because I think it's fascinating in its own right, and I hope you'll agree with me, but also to give it as a concrete example of what can happen when we allow ourselves to overcome gravitational fields. And I say allow ourselves to overcome gravitational fields. That makes it sound kind of passive. It really is a very active thing, just like using all the jet fuel to get off the ground and into space. It is not an easy thing for us to do. And perhaps it's intended not to be easy, but the results are worth it. And that is what I want to explain today with this example. And this is how the paper goes. It is titled, The Sermon on the Mount in the Book of Mormon, and this is part one. I wrote this seven years ago in 2013. When I was a missionary, it was customary to introduce the new investigator to the Book of Mormon by inviting them to read the appearance of the Savior to the Nephites in 3rd Nephi 11. Any of you who are missionaries will recognize this. This is what we did because we wanted to point out the fact that Jesus appeared to the Nephites, that Jesus is in the Book of Mormon, and that the resurrected Jesus appeared there and ministered unto them. This was an important selling point, at least at the time I served my mission. I remember being concerned whenever this invitation was given that the investigator would continue reading into 3 Nephi 12 through 14. In other words, the chapters immediately after 3 Nephi 11. And I was concerned that they would keep reading those chapters because they would realize that the Savior teaches the Nephites 
essentially the Sermon on the Mount from the King James Version of Matthew 5 through 7. Well, why was I concerned about that? Because I knew that if the investigator started asking questions about this, I would not have a satisfactory answer. In the many years since my mission, I have read most of the apologetic literature dealing with this issue. And while I have learned a number of helpful things along the way, none of the arguments have satisfied me as to why the KJV Sermon on the Mount is in the Book of Mormon. As readers of the Book of Mormon are aware, the Sermon on the Mount comes at the beginning of Jesus' teachings to the surviving Nephites, though his teachings continue for 13 more chapters through 3rd Nephi chapter 27. I was unable for a long time to come to grips with the fact that the presence of the King James Version Sermon on the Mount in the Book of Mormon is an indisputable indicator of its modern production. I covered this yesterday, you'll recall. I was so busy whistling past the graveyard and looking at other things, things that were more faith-promoting, that I didn't have to look at the King James Version in the Book of Mormon. But always in the back of my mind, the issue lurked. And the natural result was a certain amount of cognitive dissonance. And in this way, cognitive dissonance is what serves to help us get off the launching pad. It is what serves to help us be able to overcome gravitational fields, at least if we allow it to do what it's supposed to do and don't fight against it and stay on planet Earth where it is safe. Eventually, I was able to admit the obvious, that there is simply no good reason, consonant with total and complete Book of Mormon ancientness, for entire chapters of New Testament KJV, King James Version, to appear in its pages. This admission on my part had a twofold effect for me. Number one, it allowed me to finally let go the hopeless effort to explain it away in a manner consistent with the Book of Mormon being completely ancient. And it also resolved the cognitive dissonance I had long been experiencing. It is so freeing when you're able to resolve cognitive dissonance. And you resolve cognitive dissonance by just accepting what is obviously true. It sounds so simple when I say it, I know. All you have to do is accept what's obviously true. But it's not so simple in practice as it is to say it. And number two, this admission on my part also liberated me to actually look at the King James Version passages in the Book of Mormon instead of ignoring them all the time. This was huge for me. Before this, I had been so busy being afraid of the King James Version passages that I had not allowed myself to read them closely and see what they had to say in the Book of Mormon. It allowed me the freedom to ask questions about the King James Version passages, most important of which for me was, are the King James Version passages just filler? And if not, what does the Book of Mormon actually do with the King James Version passages? Once I got to the place where I could allow myself to ask these questions, I began to see that not only were the King James Version passages not filler, and that the Book of Mormon was, in fact, doing something with them, but that what the Book of Mormon was doing with the King James Version passages was complex and remarkable. Here I will begin the first of an expected three-part article examining what the Book of Mormon actually does with the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm going to focus my study on the Sermon on the Mount in the Book of Mormon. That is the King James Version passage that I will analyze here. It is easy to see this three-chapter sermon as an undigested lump, sitting there like a doctrinal island with no connection to the teachings that follow. A closer reading, however, shows that the Sermon on the Mount in 3rd Nephi is far from filler. Instead, it serves as a foundation text for the rest of the Savior's teachings, and we find threads of it woven into the warp and woof of what Jesus declares thereafter. So now I'm going to go through a number of examples of this, and I will read through this quickly. If you have your scriptures with you, it may make more sense. If you're really familiar with the Sermon on the Mount and the different sayings that are contained in it, it will make more sense. But I don't want to go too slow because I don't want to take the risk of boring my audience, and hopefully I haven't gotten to that point already. You will be glad to know at least that I will not be doing this in a backwoods folksy accent. 
Yes, I've already received some complaints from listeners about that accent from yesterday. You don't have to worry. That's not going to happen again. Moving on. And here I give a number of these different examples of what I'm talking about. Number one, the Sermon on the Mount's teaching that salt has lost its savor is good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. You remember that one. And you can find that in the Sermon on the Mount in the Book of Mormon at 3 Nephi 12, 13. That saying is applied to the fate of the Gentiles who reject the gospel later on in Jesus' teachings to the Nephites. I will suffer my people, O house of Israel, that they shall go through among them and shall tread them down, and they shall be a salt that hath lost its savor, which is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of my people, O house of Israel. That's in 3 Nephi 16.15. So once again, these are examples of how sayings in the Sermon on the Mount that is quoted in 3 Nephi 12 through 14 end up reappearing and being given new life, new meaning, and being interwoven into the text of what Jesus has to preach to them after quoting the Sermon on the Mount. Going on, number two, the Sermon on the Mount's teaching that I give unto you to be a light of this people, that's 3 Nephi 12, 14, is applied by Jesus later to his Nephite disciples, ye are my disciples, and ye are a light unto this people, who are a remnant of the house of Joseph. That's 3 Nephi 15, 12. By the way, I'm not going to say 3 Nephi every time I do these references. I want to do them quickly. All of them are from 3 Nephi, unless I tell you otherwise. Number three, The Sermon on the Mount's admonition to let your light so shine before this people, that's from 1216, becomes Jesus' Nephite teaching to hold up your light that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye shall hold up, that which ye have seen me do. And that's found in 1824. So you can see Jesus taking these sayings from the Sermon on the Mount and now elaborating upon them and giving them specific application to his Nephite audience. Number four, the Sermon on the Mount's teaching that Jesus is not come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill, that's from 1217, is echoed to the Nephites, behold, I do not destroy the prophets, for as many as have not been fulfilled in me, verily I say unto you, shall all be fulfilled, and that's in 156. Number five, similarly, the Sermon on the Mount's teaching that In me, the law hath all been fulfilled, that's from 1218, is expanded upon when Jesus tells the Nephites, he is the one who gave the law of Moses and that the law in me is fulfilled. That's from 15, four through five. Number six, the Sermon on the Mount statement that I have given you the law and the commandments with the injunction that ye shall believe in me and keep my commandments to enter into the kingdom of heaven, that's from 12, 19 and 20, is reiterated later as Christ identifies himself as the law with an injunction to look unto me and endure to the end and keep my commandments in order to have eternal life. That's from 15, 9, and 10. This will go on for 16 such examples. I let you know that so you can know when the end is coming and that there is in fact an end to these examples. We're on example number seven now. The Sermon on the Mount's declaration that old things are done away and all things have become new, that's from 1247, is picked up later when the Nephites do not understand this saying and Jesus says, marvel not that I said unto you that old things had passed away and that all things had become new. New, that's in 15, two through three. Number eight, the Sermon on the Mount's admonition that I would that ye should be perfect even as I or your father who is in heaven is perfect. That's a very famous one among Mormons. That's from 1248 in third Nephi is echoed at the end of Jesus's ministry to the Nephite disciples. Now notice we're getting all the way to the end of Jesus's ministry in third Nephi 27. It is echoed there where he says, therefore, what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. You can see how that's an echo of 1248, and that's found in 27, 27b. Now that's chapter 27, verse 27. I put b there because that's a common type of notation. If you're quoting a specific verse, but you're only quoting the first part of the verse, you give it the notation a. If you're quoting the second part of the verse specifically, you give it the notation b. So you can be a little bit more specific about what part of the verse you're citing to. So that reference again is chapter 27, verse 27, B in 3 Nephi. Number nine, the Sermon on the Mount's warning against using vain repetitions in prayer as the heathen, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking, which is found in 13.7, finds application in the Nephite disciples' prayer to God. And they did not multiply many words, for it was given unto them what they should pray, and they were filled with desire. That's from 19 
24b. Example 10. The Sermon on the Mount's pattern of prayer set by Jesus, after this manner therefore pray ye, which is found in 13.9a, once again a would be the first part of that verse, 13.9a, finds application when Jesus tells his Nephite disciples, and as I have prayed among you, even so shall ye pray in my church. That's from 18.16a. Example 11. The Sermon on the Mount's instruction that your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him, from 13.8b, is recalled later when Jesus says, And whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, which is right, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be given unto you. That's from 18 and 20. So you can see how all these different examples and all these different passages and all these different sayings from the Sermon on the Mount end up getting picked up on later by Jesus and elaborated upon and incorporated in his subsequent teachings to the Nephites. Example 12. The Sermon on the Mount's axiom that everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened, that's from 14.8, is replicated in Jesus' words to his Nephite disciples, Therefore ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For he that asketh receiveth, and unto him that knocketh it shall be opened. And that's from the last chapter of Jesus' ministry in Third Nephi, chapter 27 and verse 29. The reason I keep focusing on things that are in the last chapters is because the further it gets away from the Sermon on the Mount, as it's quoted in 3 Nephi, the more impressive I find it that these motifs are still being picked up and incorporated into the text. A number of them occur in the chapters immediately after the Sermon on the Mount is quoted. Once again, the Sermon on the Mount is quoted in 3 Nephi 12 through 14, and a number of examples come from chapters 15 and 16, which are the chapters right after the Sermon on the Mount is quoted. It seems to me it would be much more likely that the Sermon on the Mount would be incorporated in the chapters immediately following the Sermon on the Mount in 3 Nephi. But what we see is that those same references and those same echoes and those same incorporations and elaborations of the Sermon on the Mount continue not just in those chapters immediately after it's quoted, but all the way to the end of Jesus' teachings to the Nephites as far out as chapter 27, which again is the last chapter in which we have his teachings to the Nephites before he leaves them. Example 13, the Sermon on the Mount's injunction to enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way which leadeth to destruction, and many there be who go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We all know that passage. That is found in 14, 13 through 14. Finds renewed application to the Nephite disciples. And once again, this is in the last chapter of Jesus' ministry, chapter 27, verse 33, where he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. But wide is the gate, and broad the way which leads to death, and many there be that travel therein, until the night cometh wherein no man can work. Example 14. The Sermon on the Mount's teaching that whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock, that when the rain falls, etc., it fell not. But the one who hears and does not do these sayings is likened to a man who built upon the sand and his house fell and great was the fall of it. We remember that one. That's also very familiar. Frankly, pretty much all the sayings from the Sermon on the Mount are familiar. And this is found in 14, 24 through 27. Will be repeated and amplified to the Nephites where he tells them later, And if ye shall always do these things, blessed are ye, for ye are built upon my rock. But whoso among you shall do more or less than these are not built upon my rock, but are built upon a sandy foundation. And when the rains descend, and the floods come, and the winds blow, and beat upon them, they shall fall, and the gates of hell are ready open to receive them. That's from 18, 12b to 13. Example 15. We're almost to the end now. Please stay with me. Example number 15. The same teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, the one about the house built on the rock and the house built on the sand, is found in the mouth of Jesus again shortly before he gives the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is interesting because all these other examples are being given after Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount. But we can actually find a few examples of references to sayings in the Sermon on the Mount before Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount to the Nephites. And this is an example of this. This same teaching in the Sermon on the Mount is found in the mouth of Jesus shortly before he gives the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, and this is from 1140, so this is before the Sermon on the Mount, this is 1140 in 3 Nephi, where he says, and whoso shall declare more or less than this, and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil, and is not built upon my rock. You see the echo of that? Actually, it's a pre-echo. It is foreshadowing. 
but he buildeth upon a sandy foundation, and the gates of hell stand open to receive such when the floods come and the winds beat upon them. It is obvious that there is a reference being made there to the Sermon on the Mount, which Jesus has yet to give within the framework of the Book of Mormon narrative. Example 16, this is the last one. The Sermon on the Mount's string of Beatitudes, blessed are ye statements, in 12, 1 through 11, is bookended with a beatitude promised by Jesus to his disciples if they will follow his gospel. And I say it's bookended because the beatitudes come at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount and we hear the bookend at the end of his teachings to his disciples once again in chapter 27, where he says, Therefore, if ye do these things, blessed are ye, for ye shall be lifted up at the last day. And that's in 27 and verse 22. Okay, so the point of all this, I hope the point is clear, and I hope that I haven't been beating a dead horse, but it's very important to list out all these different examples so you can see that what I'm talking about really is present in the text of the Book of Mormon. It really is there. The Book of Mormon really is doing some interesting things with the Sermon on the Mount. It is not just filler, and that the only reason I was able to see this and make this examination and make this presentation out to you is because I was finally able to overcome the gravitational field of my religious beliefs regarding the Book of Mormon translation, which freed me up to make this study and this research and this analysis in the first place. It is only through overcoming those gravitational fields that I was able to launch myself into a position where I could explore and learn new things, things that I could never have learned if I had not overcome those gravitational fields in the first place. Back to the article. Though not intended to be exhaustive, I'm sure you're thankful for that, this list of 16 entries indicates that the Sermon on the Mount given in 3 Nephi 12 through 14 is not just filler, but literally and literarily permeates the balance of the Savior's teachings to the Nephites. Further, the Sermon on the Mount teachings are not simply reiterated, but are often amplified and clarified in subsequent Nephite exposition. For example, the Sermon on the Mount injunction to let your light so shine, 1216, is expanded upon to the effect that the light is Jesus himself, 1824. The Sermon on the Mount's teaching that in Jesus is the law fulfilled, 1218, is not just quoted later, but additional information given that Jesus is the one who gave the law to Moses in the first place, 15, 4 through 5. The warning against vain repetitions in prayer, 13, 7, is amplified by showing that the Nephites avoided this because it was given unto them what they should pray, 19, 24, B. Keeping track of the Sermon on the Mount threads during the balance of the Savior's Nephite ministry and using them in context and with additional elaboration is no mean feat. It introduces an unexpected complexity and beauty into this section of the Book of Mormon. But this isn't all. The next two articles will be devoted to showing additional layers of complexity in this narrative, a complexity that, like layer after layer of varnish, makes the resulting composition shine. I had planned on going forward and actually going over those additional two articles dealing with other additional complexities and how the Book of Mormon uses the King James Version within its text, but I think I've probably gone over enough at this point. I don't want to overload the circuitry because I have been talking about a lot of complexity and a lot of interrelationships and intertextuality, which is the new $5 word for this, intertextuality between the Book of Mormon and the Bible. So what I will probably do now is I will wait until tomorrow to go over those other two papers. To give you a brief idea of what's coming up in the next two parts to this paper, which indeed could be two separate papers dealing with the same theme, the second paper will deal with Malachi and Isaiah in 3 Nephi and how passages from both of those Old Testament books are used in the Book of Mormon and what the Book of Mormon does with them, once again with interesting and I think surprising results. And specifically how they are used to frame and elaborate upon the teachings that Jesus gives to the Nephites in 3 Nephi. And then the third paper, which deals with an analysis of the structure of Jesus' ministry and his sermons and teachings to the Nephites is found in 3 Nephi. I know this can get dry. I'm trying to keep this as interesting as I possibly can. And I will add at this point that this is all original research. This is research that I did. I didn't read it in somebody else's paper. This is research that I did on the Book of Mormon 
myself. And let me be clear about what it is I am not trying to tell you. I am not trying to tell you that because this complexity exists in the Book of Mormon, that it somehow does away and makes it okay that the Book of Mormon is borrowing hugely from the King James Version of the Bible. No, it doesn't make it okay. It doesn't explain why that happens. It's not an answer to that question. It is not an apologetic response. Indeed, the only reason I can get to this point is because I have transcended the apologetics, which tries to make this sort of thing fit within the dominant narrative of the church and the traditional understanding of how Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. I was only able to get to this point by leaving apologetics behind. Now, I learned many, many important things through my years in Mormon apologetics. But at some point, it came to me that being engaged in Mormon apologetics was like manning a fort. And we're manning a fort, we're all inside the fort, and the enemies are outside the fort. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that the walls are firm and in place. We have to build them high. We have to build watchtowers upon the walls. And there's a moat, and we have to dig a moat out front, and we have to put spikes outside the moat. In other words, we have to defend this position. We have to defend the church. That is the role and the job of apologetics. And we have to build that defensive position so strong and so completely that nobody can get in. But as I say, it was only sometime after this that I realized that at the same time I'm building this fort and making those walls high and strong, that at the same time I'm keeping enemies out of the fort, I'm also locking myself inside the fort. And that it was only by leaving this fort, this fort that I had made with the help of many others, but this fort that I had made and this fort that I had constructed out of Mormon apologetic tinker toys, it was only after getting out of this fort that I was able to roam around in the woods and the mountains and the fields and the rivers and the oceans and be able to see there's a great, big, wonderful, fascinating, beautiful world out there. And it is a world that I never could see while I was locking myself inside the fort. And indeed, it was a world that I never would have been able to see if I had remained locking myself inside the fort. So am I saying that the way that the Book of Mormon uses the King James Version means that the dominant narrative is true? No, what I'm saying is that only by transcending the dominant narrative was I able to make these discoveries in the first place. Am I saying that the Book of Mormon is true or inspired or God-given or that it was translated by the gift and power of God and that this proves it? No, I'm not saying that. Am I saying that this proves that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God? A lot of times when I'm talking about this, that's what people think I'm trying to prove, but it's not. It's completely different from that. All of that stuff about proving that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, or proving that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, or proving that the LDS Church is the one and only true church upon the face of the earth, all of that stuff I left behind in the fort. I'm out of the fort now. This is a completely different subject. And what I'm saying is that I can leave all that behind, and that only by leaving all that behind am I freed up to look at the Book of Mormon and see what it does with the King James Version, as I've been talking about today, and as I'll be talking about tomorrow. And this is the concrete example of what can happen when we overcome gravitational fields by accepting what is obviously true, even when it conflicts with our preconceived religious beliefs. If we stick with our preconceived religious beliefs, and many people do, and I did for many years, we lock ourselves away in the fort, We submit to the gravitational field of our religion, and it is only by overcoming those gravitational fields that we can progress, and I will use that term, and I think I use it advisedly, that we can progress to learning more things. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air. 